Hello, everybody. I was thinking the other day, what can we do as string players, particularly viola players, to make our playing have more clarity and more beauty all the time? So I thought there are a few things that we really can do, and I'm going to go over those today. Let's go over five things today that we can do to make our playing have more clarity and more beauty. In order to demonstrate this, I'm going to use some excerpts from the standard orchestral repertoire, which is good because if we practice those things, not only can we learn great technical things, but we can also prepare ourselves for the future by learning the orchestral excerpts. So it's a great idea to practice these things on a regular basis. So I'm going to start with a maxim here. All bow strokes should originate from the string. What do I mean by that? Well, in other words, if I'm playing something slow, that I don't just drop the bow on the string and start playing, but I touch the string and start very clearly from the string. You'll notice that I lift my bow very little, and when I do, that when I begin the next note, I always place the bow and then draw. So, in other words, let's place the bow on the string and then draw. The second thing I want to talk about is dotted rhythm. So, that means a dotted eighth and a sixteenth, or a dotted sixteenth and a thirty-second, or a double dot, even a dotted quarter and an eighth? Well, especially a dotted eighth and a sixteenth. Let's start with that. The greatest example of that I can think of, well, there are a couple, but one of them is the Mozart Hafner Symphony Movement One. When we play dotted eighth and sixteenth, the sixteenth note belongs to the next note. So in other words, when I play, then the sixteenth note belongs to the next note. So to there, like so. What I do is I like to make the 16th note as late as possible so it has a real snap to it. So what I hear a lot is... Which to me does not have the articulation and the clarity that we want. So what I do is I put a little space between the dotted eighth and then at the 16th I play to there. A little quicker and closer to the next beat. Which feels great because you feel a lot of space between the notes and it sounds very, very articulated, which is exactly what I want. The next example I can think of that's a well-known example, which is a little bit different, is Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, the beginning of the second movement, the Andante. So... When we play that, it's really difficult because in this case, what people really want to hear is that rhythm of one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, da, 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 da. But we don't want it to sound vertical. We want it to sound horizontal. What do I mean by that? A vertical rhythm stays in one place, so it can almost sound choppy. Like so. But what we want is to make a horizontal sound. How do we do that? Well, we have to think musically. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. I think of a line and I think of how the music moves this way. So when I play, I start to play melody. We can also add a little bit of dynamic so that I call it a ribbon that do da di da 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 da. So it's a little more curvy like that. And I'm thinking of going forward without rushing. <laughs> Like so. 
That's another handling of a dotted eighth and a sixteenth note. Another great use of dotted eighth and sixteenth in a very standard orchestral excerpt is in Don Juan. There are a lot of them, especially on the first page. So here's the one that I can think of. <laughs> something like that. And you note, these things overlap because when I played this, I see a lot of people play this, but remember, originate all bow strokes from the strings. So place, draw. So there's our first thing and our second thing in action. So we have again, some more dotted eighths and sixteenths that need to be worked at. The third thing we can talk about is hold notes to their values. What does that mean? Well, a quarter note, most people think of a quarter note has one beat or one count. It has a beat, but does it have one count? To me, a quarter note has two counts. What? Well, let me explain that. So when we start the note, that's a count, one. But a quarter note plays for a whole beat. So it's closed by B2, so it's one off. So the second beat is an off. A lot of people play the quarter notes too short because they'll play, um, let me give you an example from Don Juan. Well, that sounds fine, or does it? Well, if we take a close look at the music, the first chord, is actually a quarter note, and the second is an eighth note. So that quarter is actually twice as long as the eighth note. So I count it one, two, three, like that. So that the quarter note is very long, and the eighth note with the accent is shorter. Like that, and that's called holding a note to the value. Now that happens all the time in repertoire. Here's another place in Don Juan. You'll notice that that's one, two, one off, like that. So the quarter note, one off, uses two counts to play one full beat. When I play the Roman Carnival, I do the same thing, especially at phrase endings. You'll see that by holding those notes to their value at the end of the phrases that it completes the phrases. If I play without doing that, it starts to sound ragged. Like so. And I lose out on the opportunity to play a beautiful long phrase, which is what we really all want to do. The next thing I want to talk about is pizzicato. Pizzicato? What about it? Well, pizzicato is important too because like in Don Juan, we have a long section of pizzicatos that they listen to sometimes. Pizzicatos in general need to be vibrant and outgoing and beautiful sounding and ringy. So we want all of those characteristics in vibrato. So we have to really, really practice that. Just like when we're bowing, each pizzicato stroke needs to originate from the string. So in other words, when I play a pizzicato, I don't approach from above the string and throw my finger like that. I actually touch the string and grab it a little bit. I feel the resistance of the string and pull the note out like that. So I'm kind of letting the note out of the hat or pulling the sound out of the F holes.
even when I do those quicker notes, I start from on the string, like that. And you'll see that the sound will ring more when I do that. So I'm actually letting the sound out of the viola. Like so. The next thing I want to talk about is ever so important. The viola is a beautiful instrument. It's fun to play. It sounds beautiful. It has a great purpose in the orchestra and in chamber music and solo pieces. What makes the viola sound great is the ringing ability of the viola. So whatever I play, I'm going to get my viola to have as much ring as I can possibly get out of it. So the last thing I want to talk about is try to make every note ring. How do we do that? Well, we need to have a really beautiful bow stroke. We need to vibrate to let the sound come out. And we need synergy. We need a good thing between the bow and the vibrato to make the sound have a beautiful open and ringing sound. Let's listen to Don Quixote, the big viola solo from there just a little bit. And I'm going to try to get the viola to totally ring when I play it. That rings nicely. Some notes have a natural ring, like the G. That rings. The C. That rings. I listen to those notes and I try to get that same sound out of all the notes. Here's an A. That also rings. The notes that have open strings associated with them always ring the most. But what happens if I play an F? There's not as much ring, so I have to coax it with my bow and my vibrato. So. Another good example is Brahms Fourth Symphony, the fourth movement where we have this beautiful viola part that it's kind of aggressive. It's, it's very stormy, but it's also very beautiful. try to get it to ring there. And finally, if we play something a little quicker, we still want that ring. So how about Brahms Haydn variation number five? We'll try to get the instrument to really ring and coax the ring out of the viola. Note again how I originate from the string. <laughs> This was kind of a short and concise little synopsis of how to make your sound more clear and beautiful. And I hope you learned something from it. And I hope you'll actually take it to heart to practice some of these standard orchestral excerpts and think about what we talked about today. I'd love to hear your comments below and I'll look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, happy practicing.